Uh, good morning. It's been a, a wonderful joy uh, to be a part of Cross Culture Church of Christ's 50th Global Mission Convention. Uh, I want to again express my deepest appreciation for, to Pastor Sam Reeve and to other colleagues there for the privilege that has been extended to me to be a part of your missions convention, the 50th missions convention. And I'm only sorry, as I've mentioned several times, I'm only sorry that uh, together with my wife, uh, we have not been able to be with you in person. Uh, that would have been even more of a privilege and a joy for, for us uh, to visit Australia and to be with you there in person to share, uh, not only via camera, but in person and to get better acquainted with, with you. Uh, but we trust that the Lord has uh, used uh, these uh, videotapes, uh, these recorded messages at our church's 50th missions convention and that as we move forward into this coming year uh, that it would be with a sense of God's presence, uh, God's anointing upon, upon us, the great commission of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 28 is a passage that is so familiar to each and every one of us and I just pray that as we march forward to his great commission that we would make disciples that we would mark disciples and that we would mature disciples. Jesus says you will make disciples of all the nations. He said we should mark them by baptism, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And that we would, should mature them as well. That we should teach them to obey everything that Jesus had commanded. Three things I think are very important. We want to make disciples, we want to mark disciples, and we want to mature disciples. And I pray that the Lord would continue even more so to use cross-cultural. What a wonderful name for our church, cross-cultural. And I realize that within the context of Australia, we are already a very diverse society, a very diverse country. And so cross-cultural missions actually does not begin out there somewhere. Cross-cultural missions actually begins on our very doorstep. And I pray that the Lord would continue to richly bless and guide cross-cultural Church of Christ as we step forward into this coming year in missions. May the Lord bless and guide our every footstep. Well, this morning I would like to talk to you and share just briefly uh, from the New Testament, actually focusing our thoughts and our attention on the word door, door, D-O-O-R. There's a wonderful book uh, that I came across not too long ago written actually by a CIM, a China Inland Missionary, a mission missionary. Her name was, uh, was Johansson, was Anna Johansson. Uh, she actually came from uh, Northern Europe and she spent some 42 years in China serving among the Chinese. As other missionaries have experienced, obviously one of the first tasks of a missionary is to learn Chinese or learn the language. And for her, Anna Johansson, it was to learn Chinese, which is a, a very difficult language actually to learn because it is a tonal language, very different than English. But the Lord used her amazingly in those 42 years. And, and one of the things that captured me as I came across this book is how well she had learned the Chinese language to such a point that she was able to use Chinese characters to express something of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and the, what she chose to use was to use the Chinese word door. In Chinese, we call it mun. And it's a, in the Chinese language, there's what we call radicals. And so in, within this door radical, there are some 50, 60 different words that use the door radical in the writing uh, of, of, this, of, the, of the word or different words. And so Anna Johansson was able to use this very simple door word or this radical to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, as I was reading this book, 
uh, my thoughts went back to, I wonder how many times this word door appears in the New Testament. And so I went back and I did a, re- a, a word study of this word door. And I found that this word door actually appears 39 times in the New Testament. 39 times. And if you and I were to do an even closer study, we would actually find that this word door appears amongst these 39 times, four times within the ministry, the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul, that great missionary, that great theologian. And so this morning what I'd like to do is just to focus our attention on these four times that this word door appeared in Paul's life and in his ministry. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me first of all to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. He says, Now when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. He found that the Lord had opened a door for him. I call this first door the door of compelling vision. A vision for the unreached. A vision for the unengaged. And of course, we read here of him going to Troas. And if you're familiar with Acts and Luke's recording of the expansion of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You remember there in Acts chapter 16, actually Paul goes to Troas. Initially he wanted to go to Asia, but the Spirit prohibited him from doing so. And so he, together with Luke and other companions, came down to Troas. And and you remember there in chapter 16 of Acts, that there in the nighttime, Paul had a vision, a compelling vision. He saw a young man, you remember, from Macedonia, reaching out his hand and inviting Paul to come over to Macedonia to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And so there in Troas, there was this compelling vision, this door of a compelling vision that God gave to Paul. Vision in Paul's life. Four times over, Paul had a vision in chapter 9 where he was converted. Then in chapter 16 of Acts uh, that we have just highlighted. And then in 18, a vision of courage. Where a vision was given to him to have courage to stay in Corinth. To continue to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 26 where he said to Agrippa that he had not been disobedient to the vision that he had received. Four times vision appears. But here we come back to this Troas vision. This compelling vision. A vision of reaching the unreached. A vision of reaching the unengaged with the good news of Jesus Christ. Of course, these two words, unreached and unengaged, are very familiar words perhaps to some of us. Words that are often used in missions in the 21st century. When we talk about unreached people groups, what we're talking about is a group of people whose percentage, Christian percentage, professing Christian percentage is less than 2%. And then we also talk about unengaged people. Unengaged people are certainly unreached people, but among the unreached, there is some where there is work already in their midst. But yet there are also groups of people that are not only unreached, but they up to this point are still unengaged with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And missiologists tell us that there are probably close to 6,000 unreached, unengaged people groups around the world. I think uh, just very quickly, three groups that I think are very significant that we need to focus on as we think of missions in the 21st century. The Islamic world, the Buddhist world, and the Hindu world. Those are the three largest unreached and unengaged people groups in the world today. The Muslim world, one point Some say even 1.9 billion Muslims scattered around the world. You'll know that the largest Muslim country in the world is Indonesia. And the challenge for the church, how we can effectively reach the Islamic world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Actually, just a little over a year ago, I had the chance of going to Nepal. You'll be familiar with the fact that Nepal, well, certainly there are Islam, there are Muslims there, there are Hindus there, but Nepal is also a Buddhist centered. And I was struck as I was visiting there 
of the testimony of an early CIA missionary by the name of Frank Lerner. He wrote a wonderful book called Rusty Hinges. If you ever come across that book, I would encourage you to read it. But it describes something of the challenge of reading, reaching Tibetan Buddhists with the gospel of Jesus Christ. One billion Buddhists, brothers and sisters, are waiting to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And then it's certainly the Hindu world, some 800 million Hindus around the world. I think as we think of this compelling vision of reaching the unreached, it's important for us to also realize quickly that because of people movements, because of migration, because of immigration, actually These three groups are not only just out there somewhere, they are actually also on our very doorstep. And so the Lord has brought the mission field to our very doorstep. Just like the name of our church reflects cross-cultural. We don't have to leave Australia to be involved in cross-cultural missions. The proximity of the mission field and our very doorstep tests our sincerity for missions. The proximity of the mission field, tests our sincerity for the mission field. And so we read, first of all, of this door, this compelling vision, this door of compelling vision that was opened to Paul. And it is certainly open to us as well. Well, if you turn forward to several pages to 1 Corinthians, we'll come across another door that appeared in Paul's life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, let me just read two verses for us very quickly there, verse 8 and then verse 9. But I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost. And then notice what he says in verse 9. Because a great door for effective work was opened to me, and there are many who oppose me. And so I've called this door The door of convincing transformation. Convincing transformation. So there was a door of compelling vision, and now there's a door of convincing transformation. Incidentally, I think it's important for us maybe just to highlight very quickly that Paul goes to Ephesus. And you remember, if you're familiar with the book of Acts, you'll know that actually it's interesting to track how Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Silas, Paul and his missionary band, they went to these different major urban centers of the Roman Empire. Ephesus was one of those. Ephesus was one of those. Corinth was another. Athens, certainly, Thessalonica, and perhaps other cities come to mind. And I was just reminded as I reflected upon that of the importance of urban ministry in the 21st century. A tremendous challenge. A tremendous challenge. How do we effectively do ministry within an urban context? And I just think of China, if you're familiar Net break speed in urbanization. With probably close to 300 million migrant workers flowing into the cities right across China. The tremendous challenge of how we can effectively reach out to these people, these migrant workers. Urban ministry, a very important ministry in the 21st century. But Paul here speaks of this effective door that was open to us. We actually get an English word from the word that Paul uses, translated here, effective. We actually get the word energy from that Greek word. And it just reminds me afresh of the fact, brothers and sisters, that the gospel of Jesus Christ is certainly about salvation and the hope and the eternal hope that we have in salvation. But it also includes transformation doesn't it as well? The gospel of Jesus Christ that is able to save, that is able to not only save us, but also to transform us. There's a wonderful story in John chapter 4. You remember that Jesus on his way to uh, Galilee passed through Samaria, and there at Sychar he met this Samaritan woman. I wonder if you've ever noticed John's description Just as that woman was going to leave Jesus and go back into the city and invite the people in that city to come out and meet Jesus. John tells us that this woman left her water bucket at Jesus' feet. And I've always been struck with that description. 
And it just reminds me afresh of how her life was utterly transformed through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so as she went back into the city, I think what they, what they noticed first was not what they heard, but what they saw. They saw the difference that the gospel of Jesus Christ had done in this woman's life, in and through her. And so there is this door of convincing transformation that we're called upon to share. That we're called upon to share. A wonderful challenge. A wonderful challenge. How can we effectively share the gospel of Jesus Christ to bring about a change? There's a church in the United States that has a focus I think especially in this area, and they focus on three things. They talk about hurts, they talk about habits, and they talk about hang-ups. Hurts, habits, and hang-ups. And it focuses all around this transformation that is so important. So there was a door of compelling vision. There was a door of convincing transformation. And then the third door, Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. Paul here writes, devote yourself to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open, notice this word again, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ from which I am in chains. Pray that I will proclaim it clearly as I should. A confident proclamation. A confident proclamation. Let me just highlight something here that I think is important for us to notice. And and that is Paul's request that the Colossia Christians would pray for him. And we haven't had time. Uh, in these messages to look at the important relationship between prayer and missions, cross-cultural missions, prayer and missions. I remember J.O. Frazier, one of the early CIM missionaries who reached out to the Lisu people. You know, for 10 years, he sought to see the conversion of Lisu people without seeing one Lisu person converted. What a challenge of perseverance. And yet during those 10 years, what J.O. Frazier was able to do was to rally a group of people around him to pray for the conversion of the Lisu people. If you ever get the chance to read Mountain Rain, the story of J.O. Frazier, you'll read after 10 years how through the prayer, the faithful prayer of the saints, the door was opened and there was a mass conversion of Lisu people. Today, if you go to China... Some tell us that probably close to 80% of Lisu people in China today are Christians and can trace their spiritual heritage right back to J.O. Frazier and some of those early missionaries that served in their midst. And so Paul invites the Colossian Christians to, to pray for him. But it's interesting, obviously, that there is this confident proclamation that even though Paul was in prison, even though Paul faced opposition, yet there was this confidence in the gospel of Jesus Christ that even though he was in chains, the gospel of Jesus Christ was not in chains. And it isn't an interesting, not only throughout church history, if we would even go back to the book of Acts, we'll see that how often persecution leads to proclamation. Persecution leads to proclamation. Paul and Silas, they're in the Philippian jail. After being bit, beaten and thrown into the jail, what were they doing? Do you remember? They were singing. Praising God, and that led to not only the conversion of that jailer, but also led to the beginning of the Philippian church. What a wonderful story. And then very quickly and lastly, the fourth door. We've talked about a compelling vision. We've talked about a convincing transformation. We've talked about a confident proclamation. In Acts chapter 14, if you turn with me just very quickly, Acts chapter 14, we see this fourth door that the Lord opened for the Apostle Paul. And I refer to this door as cross-cultural expansion. Cross-cultural, just like the name of our church. Cross-culture Church of Christ. 
There in chapter 14 of the book of Acts, you'll remember that Paul and Barnabas have concluded their first missionary journey and they're on their way back to Antioch, the church that actually sent them out in the beginning of chapter 13. In chapter 14, there at the very end, this is what Luke writes, that they sailed, uh, that is Paul and Barnabas, they sailed back to Antioch where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work that they had now completed. Verse 27 goes on to say, And arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And of course, you'll know that that's a major theme in the book of Acts. Beginning with the gospel in Jerusalem. Beginning with the gospel among fellow Jews. And yet there in Acts chapter 8 that we have already highlighted last week. We see that the door was open for Philip to take the gospel to Samaria. To that Ethiopian eunuch. And then in chapter 10 where Paul goes to Cornelius' house. And then certainly throughout Paul's ministry, how the Lord opened this cross-cultural door for Paul and his team, not only to reach their own people, but to reach beyond their own people, to people of different ethnicities. And maybe just to bring that more into perspective, I think it refers not only to ethnicities, but also to different culture, different generation. And we're called, brothers and sisters, to reach out cross-culturally. And I think that cross-cultural is not and should not just be restricted to racial or, or ethnic barriers. It certainly does include that, but yet it's, it should be much more than that. Social cross-cultural work. Generational cross-cultural work. How can we reach the young with the gospel of Jesus Christ? A tremendous challenge in many ways, of cross-cultural missions. There is a a gap often, a generational gap, and how can we reach cross-culturally to these people? And so the Lord opened up this door of cross-cultural expansion. And that's the prayer that I have on my heart for us here at the very end of our 50th Global Missions Convention. That a door a great door was open, not only to Anna Johansson, the Apostle Paul. These four times we have seen these four doors open. The door of compelling vision. The door of convincing transformation. This door of confident proclamation. And this door of cross-cultural extension. And as we draw this missions convention to a close, my prayer is the Lord would open up doors for us. And the Lord would continue, and even more so, use cross-cultural Church of Christ in the work in this coming year of making disciples, of marking disciples, and of maturing disciples.